You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo, from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts, Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com, Andrew the Rock Lobster, Joe Benazzi from from OptionPit.com and Henry the Flowmaster Schwartz from SIBO. The Option Block is brought to you by SIBO. SIBO's suite of S&P 500 index options, SPX and mini S&P 500 XSP options, allows traders to speculate on the direction of the market, generate income, and hedge for downside protection of their portfolio of stocks. No matter what kind of trader you are, there's plenty of useful information to take the guesswork out of creating your portfolio strategy and to help you make more educated moves in the market. Visit www.cbo.com slash SPX today to learn more. The views expressed herein are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of CBOE Global Markets Incorporated or any of its subsidiaries, collectively CBOE. The information provided is for general education and information purposes only. There are important risks associated with transacting in any of the CBOE products or any of the digital assets discussed here. Before engaging in any transactions in those products or digital assets, it is important for market participants to carefully review the disclosures and disclaimers contained at www.cboe.com slash us underscore disclaimers these products and digital assets are complex and are suitable only for sophisticated market participants these products involve the risk of loss which can be substantial and depending on the type of product can exceed the amount of money deposited in establishing the position market participants should put at risk only funds they can afford to lose without affecting their lifestyle and now get ready to hit the option block All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again for the Thursday edition of the Option Block, what the cool kids call the old OB. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E, OptionsInsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you are binging and mainlining these days. Hope you're having a good trading week out there. We aim to make it better, if possible, here with a little bit of fun content on the old show. A couple of things to remind you of right off the top here. Of course, if you're not listening to the full network, man, you're missing out. So get over there, subscribe to the full network feed wherever you get this. It's available to us about every platform under the sun. B, if you like what you hear, throw a star, a like, a comment, whatever the heck your platform lets you do. All of it in aggregate does help new people continue to discover the content. And if you too want more content in your lives, you're ready to graduate to the next level, the 201, dare I say it, the 301 of options trading, then you know where to go, theoptionsinsider.com. And put on a little slash pro at the end. If you're cool, you can put on slash secret club. They both work. And that'll get you to the land of the pro. Double pro shows every week. Exclusive feed with 250 plus episodes. Live streams, giveaways. Just ask Wolfpack how cool his pro Q&A, uh, excuse me, his pro trading crate was. Uh, pretty cool stuff. All sorts of fun stuff there. Theoptionsinsider.com. Slash pro is the place to go. As we go around the horn, no Uncle Mike today. He has been called away. He is on assignment for the show, but he'll be back on the old Monday episode. But in his stead, now he has to be, uh, has to play a dual role, not just his traditional curmudgeon, but also our resident optimist, our resident permable. Let's see if he can do it. 
He is the rockingest of lobsters, Mr. Andrew Gibonazzi from OptionPit.com. Mr. Rock Lobster, how are things in the land of Maine, and can you handle your permable role today, sir? Um, I, I can wear my permable hat. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. I, I do have a, a good ending to my uh, my um, uh, my Uvix puts, but uh, I'm going to make <laughs> the listeners wait for those. Uh, I may have I may have delved back into those waters this week as well. So all sorts of fun to be had out there. And then also joining us, speaking of fun, it's always fun when the Flowmaster rolls into town because we get to record in the same room, which is a rare treat. Yes, I'm joined by the Flowmaster himself, Mr. Henry Schwartz from SIBO, beaming to you live from the deep bowels here of not SIBO East, but SIBO proper here in Chicago. Mr. Flowmaster, welcome back to Shy town sir. Thank you, Mark. I'm always happy to be here, and I do love coming to the the SIBO headquarters, this old post office. It is the coolest building I've ever gotten to work in, so uh, I'm happy to happy to host you, and I'm glad we get to hang out. Henry is a good host. They have fun snacks here. They have delicious spicy pickles and one of those make your own uh, soda machine. So it's all all sorts of good stuff here in the SIBO as we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading. And it seems like, I don't know, Rock Lobster might have his job come out for him today in the optimism camp because it looks like things were, they were kind of treading water coming into the start of the show. Markets were maybe slightly off a tenth of a percent, slightly up. Nothing really to write home about. And now it does seem like the worm is turning. I think they're, they've heard that the Flowmaster and I are in the same room together. And that just seems to be killing the markets out there today. Because now as we're coming into the start of the show here, uh, we moved from pretty much unch in the S&P to off about half a percent. Uh, the Dow off about half a percent. And the NASDAQ off about half a percent. So very egalitarian day today, but all to the dark side. And when we kicked off the show, VIX was at a 14 and a half. I got a wager. It's prob- that puts it down half a point from the Monday show. It's probably popping a little bit from that level now. I'm sure if I re-rack that. Uh, VVIX at an 85. That puts it literally unched from where it was on the Monday show. VXX at a 20, down about three quarters of a point from last show. UVXY 12 and a half, down about three quarters of a point as well. Starting to threaten that 10 handle again. Lo and behold, we're going to have to reverse put this thing again pretty soon. Uh, SVIX 30.3. I bet you our guest on Ballview's wishes he had those 35 calls again. His back pocket up, up a point out there this week. And UVIX continuing to erode uh, 23 and three quarters. At least it was coming into the start of the show. That puts it down about one and three quarters points. But we all know UVIX, a difficult beast to pin down out there these days. By the end of the show, who knows? It'll be seven handles away uh, from where it is right now. A lot of fun to be had out there in UVIX land this week. Uh, but speaking of fun, it's always fun to talk to the flow master in person. Uh, let's go around the horn the opposite of the way we, we went. Let's start in uh, the SIBO hot seat. Corporately enough in the SIBO today. Mr. Flowmaster, sir, what is catching your eye out there as we apparently are turning to the dark side, sir? Yeah, I was just digging into why we we, we went from dead flat and, and one of the quietest days we've seen in, in weeks to down about 20, uh, you know, which is a pretty decent move for you know, almost half a percent very quickly, right? Uh, right about when we sat down together. So I haven't seen any news yet, uh, but I was looking at, you know, we, we had a pretty amazing turnaround from, you know, the, the fear we were seeing about 10 days ago to uh, just the most optimistic, you know, sentiment that we've seen in a while, right? We had, I think we had eight or nine days basically straight up for almost all the averages, definitely SPX. Uh, and you had VIX come in, uh, you know, almost six points over a week. So, uh, you know, today could just be a little bit of a, a little profit taking or maybe just kind of a little bit of reversion. Uh, but, you know, all of the kind of the, the news that I'm seeing and the people I'm listening to, uh, you know, the sentiment really has turned away from some of the fear that we were seeing. And, you know, people are people are kind of in a good mood. Good mood indeed out there, which is uh, we'll see if that persists as this sell off today. Uh, we'll see if that persists as well. Uh, let's go out to the man doing double duty today, both the optimist and the diehard pessimist that he is at heart. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what is catching your eye out there in today's looks like a downturn in market? Uh, yeah. Are, are you guys both recording from the SIBO or is this Henry's at SIBO at the SIBO no, no, building? We're both- 
both in the same room. I'm reaching out. I am touching Henry right now. I can I can Stop confirm that. Ouch! He Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so are you? So the, I guess I, you know what I was going to say something, but I, I I'm letting it. I'm letting the idea pass before I actually say it because this is a G-rated show, and my mother does listen to it. All right. So, oh my, yeah. You know what? Once again, uh, I think bond auction problems. There was another week uh, bond auction, and I'm going to keep going on my theory that the ridiculous spending by the federal government will not be a problem until it is. But I guess at some point they could stop spending money, but we all know that's never going to happen. Although, the bond market is in control of it to a large degree. So, um, you know, with that being said, right now, this this auction was definitely a little weaker. And all we're going to get out of it is looks like around, what, down a half, less than half a percent. So as much as, again, the same theory is it doesn't matter till it matters. I don't think it still matters that much, although it does uh, when you're when the market's looking for um, a little downside move, or looking for a reason to sell off, and when the, it's kind of thin, that's certainly a good enough reason. So, and I think that's that's where we find ourselves. I think we're looking for. Uh, there has definitely been some good stories. Uh, Q story is pretty good. Um, still, you know, it's still strong. Apparently, everybody is just running to those stocks, and that's. And that's where everybody is. There's no, there's no like, there's no middle ground on it anywhere. It's just okay. We're just going to run to the Q stocks, or if it's uh like one of the fat drugs, like Ozempic, you're buying Lilly or Novo Nordisk. Um, I don't even know if I pronounced that right, but it's whatever that Novo stock is in you know the Netherlands or whatever. Um, like, but they're not buying anything else, and it's quite a um. You know, I think that's what we got. The rest of the market, there still could be, it would be nice to have a little bit more participation, but um, it's just, it's not, you know, it's not materializing as much yet. So, and then we have, of course, Powell will say more stuff this afternoon, but I don't think he needs to raise rates anymore because the bond market is doing all the work for him at this point. I think his, he has done his job. He has gotten rates high enough and it's kind of hard to not pay attention to the level that they're at. It's kind of hard indeed. This is the point of the show. If Uncle Mike was here, that he'd be telling us all to get on the boat with the 10-year note. Interesting discussion of rates and some of the importance of round numbers on TWIFO. A rear early TWIFO this week, listeners. So no TWIFO after the show today because you already heard it. You already got it yesterday. We were joined by our buddy, uh, Mr. Blue Putnam over there, the chief chief economist over there in CME land to break down some fun research. If you want to hear research on rates and everything else uh, they have cooking under the sun over there, then check out that episode if you haven't already, after you're done listening to this one, of course. But Mr. Flowmaster, you were regaling us, or you regaling me, I should say. There was no one else in the room. <laughs> you were regaling me before we started the show with your size trade out there in all things zero day, which you think, you speculated, may have been sizable enough to turn the market to the red, sir. So uh, break it down for us, sir. What were you slinging? Uh, it's possible I spooked the market. I did actually trade a five lot of SPX right before we sat down. Not that I anticipated anything, but but I, I will tell you what I was. I, I I actually was thinking about leverage, and and I I got to see Tom Sosnoff speak twice in the last week. He was at a Bloomberg panel uh, two days ago, and at Sifma the week before, which was a conference, and he was talking about leverage, uh, and it was funny. He has some some strong talking points, and they're really interesting, and he knows the business uh, so well. It really is interesting to hear him speak. But he was – what he was a little bit complaining about was kind of the differences in leverage between equity and futures and options. And it, and it got me thinking on options. So I did – I actually wrote a little query to pull out the effective leverage uh, from the SPX zero-day complex – and th the simplest way I could think of doing that was just basically taking the 50 delta options uh, in SPX over the course of the day, dividing the price uh, by the delta, so basically doubling 
price of an at the money or, or think about just taking the straddle price and then seeing how much uh, basically how much buying power you were getting in terms of delta and so and then really thinking about how that plays versus uh, you know with equities it's there's basically two to one leverage for most people right that's that's your your uh, that's what you're allowed to borrow in margin right so if you want to buy spy you you know for you can buy two thousand dollars worth of spy with a thousand dollars of cash and there are some ways to get up to I think six x uh, for hedge funds, but you know futures themselves. Uh, I I looked it up. The margin on a on an e mini is around uh, I think it's eleven thousand eight hundred dollars, which based on where S and P is gives you kind of a re- leverage ratio of about twenty times, right? So you know meaning two hundred dollars buys you a thousand dollars worth of market exposure. And then what was interesting is in my little query is you you have to think about what the price of an option is getting you right now you can buy a deep in the money call and and you know we, we all know that's basically a delta of one to one so if you buy a twenty dollar call uh, on a forty four hundred dollar index it's gonna you know that's what you're controlling but by doing it by just looking at the at the monies i it, it struck me that the leverage you get kind of as the day progresses and that straddle gets cheaper the leverage is going up right if you think about it at the very very end of the day the leverage is almost infinite in a way because an option that's you know down to thirty cents, if if it if it is getting you delta, is uh, is a huge ratio. But what was interesting was midday. I was looking at basically when the straddle was trading around twelve ish dollars, which you know kind of with VIX where it is and VIX one D where it is specifically, um, that that's kind of about your one p.m. Uh, price is, has been around twelve dollars in the straddle, and. The leverage ratio uh, for the options then comes out to about uh, about 160 to one. So today's trade really was I was just kind of thinking about the, you know, what side of that you want to be on. And you know, we've talked about the zero day flow. I've talked about it many times, and there are a lot of premium sellers in there. But today I was kind of like just thinking, wow, you know, for for you know for a six dollar put, you're getting basically you know, uh, you know, 150 times leverage. And I got lucky the market sold off and I, I had left a limit order out there to sell it. So I just took some, took some quick profits, pays for, pays for the lunch that I'll buy Mark after the, after we record this. Map Map serpent serpent and turf to go then after this. No, I'll buy you a taco downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, you know, it's just, it's, it's really interesting me to me. I love digging into the data and with options, you can get lost in the, you know, the binomial tree and the Black Shoals Merton model and everything else. But to just kind of the, the 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 most refreshing thing about the zero day pricing to me is it, you can think about it very simplistically, right? Like if you buy a straddle for twenty dollars, how much does the market need to move for you to make any money? Well, the answer is twenty dollars, right? So. Uh, I just had some fun digging into it, and I think it's important to keep in mind, uh, you know, there are times where that that leverage is very, very powerful, right? It's also very dangerous, uh, and people need to understand what they're doing. And I think that's, you know, Tom's point was was really that it's also a little bit, it can be problematic when there's such a difference in leverage ratios between futures and stock. And, you know, options are kind of their own special uh, animal because they decay and therefore the leverage is, is going to naturally be increasing. Um, but it's just, it was, it was my exercise for the week. And, um, uh, I thought it was really interesting. Very interesting indeed, sir. I'm looking forward to that, uh, surf and turf to go, uh, for a lunch here on the back of Henry size five lot out there. Uh, but let's get into speaking of Henry and his data. Let's, let's crunch some more numbers on Henry's data. Shall we courtesy of all things, a trade alert out there. And as Henry mentioned, uh, to kick off, the day it isn't the most action-packed uh, Thursday that we've seen. Uh, certainly, just even in the last a couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of bangers out there of late. Today, not exactly falling into that category. Uh, Three hundred sixty-nine thousand contracts on the tape for VIX right now. That's pretty light, especially when you can see the ADV. ADV has come in a little bit as well. It's back below nine hundred K, but not much. Eight hundred fifty-four thousand is the ADV in VIX land. So that's still a whole heck of a lot of paper and doesn't seem like VIX is going to threaten that today unless this uh, this downturn maybe really turns into something or we see the mother of all whipsaws out there. Uh, SPY right about where we expect it to be, 4.3, actually 4.36 million right now. The ADV a little bit north of nine. So SPY managing to hang in there. VIX not so much. Uh, the S also right about in line with what we expect, maybe a little bit light. These days, 
It used to be one million this time of day was a banger day. Now one and three quarters million is about what we expect. And it's a little bit shy of that 1.6 million. Uh, The ADV though, 3.4 million. Again, that's still to me just a redonkulous amount of paper to expect in the S every day, but that's what we're seeing. So uh, intriguing stuff out there. Small caps. They've been a weird one to watch of late as well. Everyone's kind of wondering uh, what's going on with small caps. Are they marching to the beat of their own drummer? And the answer is yes. Again, today, they're outpacing the rest of the market. Everything is off about a quarter of a percent. Now they have mitigated some of that sell off. Uh, the small cap still down about six tenths of a percent. So small cap still kind of doing their own thing out there. Uh, doing decent paper today as well. Doesn't seem like they're going to hit their ADV, but you never know. The day is young. Uh, they're closing in on 600 K in small caps right now. The ADV is about 1.8 million. So uh, they're about a third of the way there. And the Q is about two and a half million. The ADV over four now, 4.2. So the Q's putting up some banger numbers out there these days as well. Speaking of bangers, is it a banger day on the single name front? And the answer is kind of, we have seen this interesting uh, inverse correlation between the major indices and this and the single names when the major indices are really lighting it up single names seem like kind of the land that time forgot and now maybe a little bit of vice versa the the indexes aren't exactly blowing the doors off single names not blowing the doors off either but doing respectable paper it cost you 234,000 contracts uh, to break into the top 10 today that gets you to our old friend microsoft again number 10 looks like microsoft selling off about half a percent so pretty much moving right in line with the market right now 362.62 out there and the number 10 spot. Number nine, Amazon. Man, how the mighty have fallen. That also shows you that we are in the teeth of earnings season. Listen, there's a little bit of topsy turviness uh, going on out there. Amazon, number nine, 274,000. Amazon selling off about three quarters of a buck right now, trading right around 141. And a third, number eight. Moving from the Amazonians to the land of crypto. We all know if you listen to the crypto rundown, certainly listeners, that uh, crypto has been on the rampage of late. Coinbase reflecting that. Coinbase today, 334,000 contracts and the number eight spot up six and a third or a little over 7% out there. My goodness, strong pop for them. Uh, Again, Coinbase, the uh, number eight spot out there. Number seven, AMD. So chip zone coming a little little early today, 373,000 for AMD. AMD right now up about a buck and a quarter, trading 114.85 out there for AMD. Number six, another A name right behind it, AMC, 376,000 contracts. They're coming for AMD today, though. 885 is where it's trading right now, off about a point and a quarter, a little over 12%. So not a great day to be uh, the reigning king of the apes, but we all know. That could change on a dime. Now, some of these names are seeing in here today. This is uh, 2021 all over again. We have Coinbase in there. We have AMC. And now right behind it, number five listeners, uh, Mara. Haven't seen Mara in the top 10 in quite some time. And popping back in there today at number five, Marathon Digital Holdings, $9.58, up about a little over a buck or about 12%. So similar 12% pops for Coinbase and for Mara today. Uh, Mara, for a lot of you, is one of your most popular surrogates, certainly from an optionable perspective for all things crypto out there. We've done these surveys in the past. What do you guys prefer to trade your crypto options on and get your crypto options exposure? Is it straight, let's say, Bitto, or is it Coinbase, or is it Mara? And a lot of you like to come down on Mara. Popping hard today, again, a little over a buck, and good for the number five spot out there, 448,000 contracts in Maryland. Number four, the Diz catching a little bit of a lift out there. After hearing this narrative forever that their streaming is garbage, they can't make any money on it. Apparently, they at least reversed that slide, at least for now. Diz popping hard today, $90.82, so closing in on 91 bucks. They were just 78 79 not too long ago. Up six and a third today, or about 7.5%. Good for the number four spot. 465,000 contracts on the tape for them. Uh, number three, yes, I said number three, it's the fruit company, uh, Apple, up nearly half a buck today, trading 183 and about a third out there. Of course, they were below 170 not too long ago as well for this one. So they had a nice pop like the rest of the market. Everything's had a nice pop post Powell today coming in a little light, 645,000 contracts and the number three spot. Number two, it's uh, the tip of the AI spare. Call it what you will. It's NVIDIA, 478 and about a third, up 1261 or about two and three quarters percent today. So a nice pop for them out there today. And again, good for number two and over a million, 1.13 million contracts. Might be saying, man, 1.13, that's close to Tesla numbers. And you're right, but not enough to outpace Tesla today. Tesla putting up some serious numbers, a little over two, 2.03 million 
contracts on the tape for Tesla right now. Uh, Tesla turning things the other way. Tesla 208 and three quarters off 13 and a third out there right now, about 6%. So they are coming for Tesla today. More looks like more analyst drama out there. An analyst coming out today saying the stock can drop 34%. So a day that ends in Y, you're going to have analyst drama of some way, shape, or form in Tesla. Today, it seems like it's to the dark side. By the way, it's putting up 2 million contracts. In terms of putting up volume, we are, again, in the teeth of a pretty robust earnings season, listeners. Big names popping off this week. We had Uber and Rivian and Gilead and Bumble. We're going to come back to that one, I think, a little bit later. Bumble, that was on Tuesday. eBay, the first report from TKO Group out there. Does WWE and UFC combine? Do they make money? Well, we found out this week. Wednesday, Roblox, Warner Brothers Discovery, Under Armour, the aforementioned AMC, and the aforementioned Diz, as well as Lyft. Today we have, oh, some company I never heard of, Mr. Rock Lobster, called Oatly. I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, Yeti and Krispy Kreme. And tomorrow we've got our friend Stone Cold. Lucky for you folks, we have hot in our little hands here. Uh, We have new updated earnings move reports. Let's do the results really quickly. You guys can see all these for yourselves on the website. Uh, Some big names popping off this morning, obviously. Disney, probably one of the biggest. Uh, They went into their announcement, 84 and a half. They were pricing in 6%, and they delivered 6.3% coming in right out of their earnings. So Disney moving pretty much in line with their straddle out there, listeners, uh, which is kind of interesting out there. Let's keep on rolling. Let's go out to before the bell. We had Krispy Kreme today as well. They were at 13, almost 13 and a half going into their announcement. They're pricing at 8.3 percent. Remember, we've been saying for a while the bias is to more vol, it seems like these days on the earnings front. And it looks like that worked out for Donut because they moved about 10, almost 10 and a half percent right now. So Krispy Kreme outperforming their straddle disney pretty much looking right in line with it again if you hold these throughout the day listeners that performance is going to change this is just the immediate post post earnings blush let's just see if any others were popping off this morning uh we had uh twilio that's an interesting one <laughs> they were yesterday after the bell 5581 is where they went into their announcement they're pricing at 11.2 percent they delivered about half of that about 5.5 percent so not exactly a banger day for them. Maybe uh, the exception that proves the rule to the buying of premium this cycle, listeners. And then let's go out to – let's just look here really quick. Well, there's a ton popping off today, listeners. You could check all of those as well. Unless you're, unless you're super excited about Yeti Holdings. I know a lot of you are out there, listeners. <laughs> Yeti Holdings uh, today before the bell. 39 and the third. They're pricing in – get this, 11.2% listeners. Uh, they delivered one and a half percent so my goodness they they did a whole heck of a lot enough and now they're almost literally unched they're off about four cents <laughs> so their their stock has not budged and they were pricing in over 11 percent. so this might be the uh, the premium sale of the cycle right here listeners let's go out to lift they were yesterday after the bell as well they went into their announcement 10 and three quarters and they were pricing in 13 percent listeners and at the time we ran the support, they had moved less than 1%. Uh, so they were they were crushing it to the uh, premium selling side as well. They moved a little bit more now. They moved about 2.5%, but still dramatically outperforming their straddle. So, hey, if you were leaning on the more juice front, then at least right now, not looking good. Speaking of more juice uh, or perhaps not pricing in as much juice, we have our friend Stone Cold there after the bell tomorrow. They're trading 10 and a third. They're pricing in 55 cents. In the past, they've moved almost three x that, about a buck forty one. So, they're pricing in a whole heck of a lot of nothing, which is fascinating. And then uh, coming up next week, we've got uh, Target fifteenth before the bell, about one ten is where they were trading. They're pricing in seven eighty three. In the past, they moved seven thirty one. So let's go to Walmart as well. Get the other half of the big box retail equation. They're the sixteenth before the bell, one sixty four and a third. They're pricing in five dollars and eighteen cents. In the past, they moved six oh eight. So. A little bit lighter on the Walmart front, a little bit heavier on the Target front, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Speaking of interesting, the season right now hanging out at 114%. So remember I said it was probably going to come in, and that is indeed the case. So 649 names reporting. Uh, We have come in from whatever it was to start the the season, a ridiculous 133%. We're now down at a still ridiculous but more more reasonable 114%. Our long-term average is exactly even, is exactly 100%. So I I guess they've been getting it right out there of late listeners speaking of getting it right let's see if it's our turn to do that listeners it is time for the odd block 
It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. It's time to get weird. It's time to get wild. It's time to unleash the Flowmaster, which is a little bit disconcerting because he's sitting right next to me. So you never know what he's going to bring out there today. But uh, you know what? He has set his eyes on a frequent offender here, both on the odd block and in the options oddities. This is the name we talked about a few times. Uh, this is Bumble, a.k.a. Uh, the site, the destination for ladies looking for love. We're trading a little bit shy of 14 bucks right now, 1392 But if you look at it on the year, it's been a bit of a rough year. It's off about seven bucks or about a fully a third, 33 percent of the high came. There we go. The high was almost 28 bucks, 27.92. That was back in February, right on February 2nd, right in the high. A lot of the market hit their high then and uh, bumble right along with it. And then ever since then, it's been pretty much dark side. And if you've been listening to the shows for a while, listen, you know, we've talked about There's a size put seller out here. They've been doing it for a while. They've been doing it usually similar size, similar percentage out of the money every month to two months. And it's mostly been working out. They've mostly been keeping a lot of the premium that they've been collecting out. I'm hard pressed to think of any time really where they've had the stock put to them, but I'll have to go back and look for myself. Uh, But that said, Mr. Flowmaster, seems like you have uncovered them yet again. They're back to business out there in Bumble, sir. What did you find? Well, yeah, this is a kind of an example of why it's nice to kind of keep an eye on the markets and, you know, anybody can kind of look at, at flow and say, oh, gee, the option volumes, you know, six times normal. Uh, but you start to see some patterns. And I actually was talking to a colleague of mine or an ex-colleague, and, you know, he actually said that one of the one of the a very important part of the way that the bank he used to work at made money was by knowing which clients uh, were were very smart in terms of maybe delta or volatility moves, and basically kind of knowing which trades you wanted to aggressively hedge, or maybe which kind of trades uh, you you might not need to hedge. So, and this one in Bumble is is as you said, it's really similar to something we've seen a few times. So yesterday we saw we saw so it's an interesting one though because the data was a little tricky. Twenty four thousand four hundred of the D's eighth. Okay. So it's a month from yesterday, 11 strike puts traded for 11 cents. Now the the quote on the screen at the time was a nickel at 15 cents. So mid market was a dime traded at 11. It's slightly above the midpoint. So, uh, you know, if, if you, if you didn't have any additional information to go off of, you might guess that this was a put buyer traded in an auction facility, but that's very, very close to mid market, which, you know, we kind of know is, is, is harder to figure out. Uh, Fortunately, I was able to see that uh, that some of the flow which hit the SIBO exchanges was actually a customer put seller. So, uh, and then you know, I recall you know this is a, this they pocket about two hundred sixty eight thousand dollars in premium. This is a twenty percent downside strike because the stock was um, thirteen fifty eight at the time, and it's really similar to what we saw just a few weeks ago when twenty thousand of these ten puts were sold for thirteen cents. And those are actually still open. So, you know, as you said, Mark, this this customer seems to be um, very aggressive. You know, we, we, these are the things we call line in the sand, because basically this is somebody taking a, a very large position that that the stock is not going to get down to their strike. Or if it does, they're going to take a big, big position in the stock because this is not a trade you're going to be able to get out of very well uh, if things get weird. So um, it's a bullish trade. It's a bullish trade in the form of a put seller. Uh, and you know, as we've seen, they've they've managed to adjust their other trades. Even when the stock hasn't hasn't really gone up, uh, I was able to find a few examples where the stock did sell off another twenty or thirty cents from when they got into the trade. But time decay worked in their favor, and they were able to you know keep that premium. Yes, I was looking here while you were talking. I was able to uncover the the recent history of what is probably the same customer, maybe some more paper they they inspired. Uh, going back to June, listeners, and it seems like that's that level. That's about their size. They're pocketing somewhere around a quarter of a million. Uh, per month out here doing this strategy, 
Going back to June, they sold the July 15 puts for 21 cents, 13,500 times. Those worked out. The stock was 17 and three quarters at the time. So they're talking a little over two, almost three bucks out of the money. Uh, the stock ended up closing at 18 and three quarters. So that worked out. They made close to 300 grand, about 283,000 on those. They sold the AUG 12 half puts for 24 cents, 15,000 times. They sold the AUG 15 puts 14,000 times when the stock was 1962 for around 20 cents. That one worked out. They made about exactly a quarter of a million on those. They sold 20,000 of the AUG 12 half puts for 26 cents when the stock was right about 17 bucks. Uh, those pretty much worked out as well. We have the SEP 15 puts for 26 cents, 15,000 times, and then 15,000 more for 28. Uh, so I'll show you 7,000 times for 26 cents and then 15,000 times for 28 cents. So it's seemingly the same customer listener as the stock at the time. That was actually a little bit close for them. The stock was 16 and a half bucks and they sold the 15 puts. So that was playing a little bit close to the fire for them. But in aggregate, these have pretty much worked out. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on these ones from today and see if these are the latest to add to their their long litany of put profits. Mr. Rock Lobster, we've been talking about selling puts in Bumble for a while, you and I. And they seem to mostly be working out. What do you think about this person diving back into the fray again today? Today's ones were the Dece 11s this time and in the weeklies this time. too. They don't usually play in the weekly. So what are your thoughts there? Mixing it up a little bit. Yeah, you know, every time I hear Bumble, I keep remembering like that um, that Santa Claus is coming to town or the uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Remember Bumbles, Bumbles can't, what are they, Bumbles can't swim? I don't know why, but every time I think of that, I hear that. Um, we have, you know what? We have seen this 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 before in here several times, as you mentioned. So, uh, you know, I, I guess, um, again, the line in the sand is still going strong. Um, I think and this this person, I guess, just wants to own the stock at a lower price. I mean, it's there's still margin. I've, I've, I've always tried to figure out the... It's like, does somebody have like extra margin kicking around that does this strategy? Um, it's the only thing I can think of. Um, uh, there used to be a guy on the SIBO floor. Uh, I will not invoke his name like I did the last time. And he used to do this, did it for years. And I think uh, 2008 wasn't great for him. But anyway, um, but yeah, but, I, but whoever does this historically i i'm trying to remember they might have gotten dinged once and even then i think they it, the stock came back but it, it just looks like they keep doing the same thing i mean um and it looks like uh they think bumble has a future no surprise there you know i may be one went against them but i'm hard pressed to think of even that one you're right i think they mostly have all worked out and all for around that quarter of a million dollar level uh so we'll see if these hit again for them listeners speaking of hitting uh, Mr. Flowmaster, it seems like your your trade of the day newsletter, which we keep, or not, it's not a newsletter, it's trade of the day report, but we keep threatening to put this out to the masses. Uh, this one hit upon uh, a winner, winner, chicken dinner yesterday. And a name, I don't think we talked about his name before. This is Spirit Aero Systems Holdings, Inc., ticker symbol SPR, trading right around 24 bucks right now, 23.95, up 90 cents or about three and three quarters percent today. This is the world's largest first tier aero structures manufacturer. So forget about those second tier ones. We don't talk about them on the show. Only first tier for us here on the show listeners. On the year, let's see, a year ago was trading about 26.70. So they're off nearly three bucks on the year, about two and three quarters. And then they rallied to their high for the year. Again, like a lot of names around the fe early February timeframe, 38 and about a half was their high. Uh, then they started coming for it. They crushed it, listeners, all the way down to about 1465. That was back in September, September 21st. And then since then, it's been on the rampage all the way up to about 25 bucks and change last week before uh, selling off a little bit over the last few sessions. But Mr. Mr. Flowmaster, what did your what did your trade of the day reports discover for us, sir, in Spirit Aerosystems? So yeah, I, I agree. I gotta we gotta set you up to to make this a joint product because it's I think, I think the folks would like this. Yes. It, it is it is really interesting. And I, I, I grabbed it today to just see I've been at a we've had a derivatives conference in, in CBUS while I'm here for the last couple of days. So I've been really busy and I pulled up the report and I was astounded to see the same ticker was in the like in the top ten most profitable directional sweeps, which is what that report is showing. SPR, November 23 calls, were in like five of the top 10. 
And when I see, and basically the biggest one was a 30 cent call buyer in the Nov 23 calls uh, in the morning, like like three minutes into the day, uh, 30 cents they paid and those things closed at 95 cents. So that was a 200% uh, winner, you know, $100,000 profit on $100,000 in, in premium. And I went and dug around a little bit deeper. It looks like they, they announced a secondary or some sort of a equity shelf. And I think this is, the European airline parts maker or something. But so the stock was actually down pretty hard in the morning and somebody took that as a great opportunity to just load up. I don't know if they had done their homework, they knew why the company was going to issue the the shares and what they were going to do with the capital. But um, basically on the day we saw about 20, um, 28,000 of these Nova 23 calls were bought. Uh, most of them opened and uh, it just was kind of a, a huge bullish scoop. They net opened um, 16,000 of them. And like I said, average price in was about 40 cents. They closed at 90 cents. Uh, just a big winner. And then the stock's up further today. So, uh, you know, I, I would expect, um, looking now, if we're seeing any, any unwind, it does look like they've gotten out about maybe maybe 10,000 today. So they're probably going to take take some profit so that, you know, and then basically keep the position on that, that they've paid for with, you know, with the house money. And, um, you know, stock up 4% almost, they're, they're doing fine. Always nice to have a little house money in the back pocket. Mr. Rock Lobster, I know you guys have been scanning for activity on your own side there. Have you come across all this fun in Spirit Aero Systems holdings? And uh, what are your thoughts? Someone, uh, someone pocketing a little change out here, sir, to the upside. Got oh. AMBC, is that it? AMBC. Now that's next. Yeah, now you're giving away. Now you're giving away secrets. Oh, so and there what? it is. SPR, like <laughs> there okay. you okay, are. Like good. I know you only have one eye, but it isn't that hard to find. I I know. I I, I was looking at it. Like oh, it's and like holy. Okay, so but then I have to parse all of this, um, which is not easy because I got to figure out. Blame Henry. He just does the data dump. We try to collate it. For I, I know. And then you guys try to. And then you have to you have to parse the Henry. Um. Hey, what? You look at that while we we, we go on to the next one. Yes, yeah, so you guys go to the next one because I'm How just, that? I'm, ho- I'm hopeless that? right go. now. That way, hopeless. Mama Mama Lobster won't get mad at us for uh, for cutting her son <laughs> off. All right, let's keep on rolling. You just gave away the the next ticker. The Flow Master has been eyeballing here. Uh, this is Ambac Financial Group ticker symbol AMBC. Uh, they provide uh, bond insurance, so all sorts of fun going on. This is the sexiest of sexy names out here. But looking pretty sexy today, 1440 up about a buck oh seven or about eight percent. So things are rocking in the world of bond insurance listeners. On the year, let's see how they're faring there. Also a decent year, up about a point. So pretty much all their gains for the year coming today, it seems like. A year ago they were thirteen forty one. So yeah, they popped a buck. They're up about a buck on the year and they're up about a buck today. So uh, they were unched until this morning out there. And then on the year, they kind of drifted to their high. Uh, earlier in the year, about 17 and three quarters in the January time frame, it seems like. Then they were slowly drifting down to their nadir, pretty much it hit 11 and a quarter on October 23rd. And then since then, it's pretty much been uh, straight up, up over three bucks here, about 310 uh, since then. So a good few weeks out here for AMBAC Financial Group. All that a long way around to saying, Mr. Flowmaster, sir, what did you find out here? And remember, make it very clear and explicit. So the rock lobster can follow along. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so this one actually, it's funny. We, we have a lot of very smart people at SIBO. And one of my associates, Jody Gunsberg, who's our head of strategic partnerships, was on Bloomberg TV a couple days ago, and I happened to catch it. And she was talking about which sectors uh, tend to do better in a rising rates environment or high high interest rates environment, and one sector she was not super keen on was financials. Um, the the she was also talking about the dispersion index, which I've mentioned on on this show, which is basically a, a new measure that we have, which shows the implied uh, correlation of of stocks um, from the individual volatilities. Basically, a high dispersion means there's going to be some stocks that go up and other stocks that go down and low dispersion is, is kind of the same as high correlation. So, uh, if everything goes up together or everything goes down together, that's uh, low dispersion. So right now we're actually kind of at a higher dispersion end of the spectrum, meaning it's a kind of good environment for stock pickers. And, um, so I happened to catch this one, and this is a bullish trade in finance in a financial name. Now I don't know I don't know what the bond insurance 
firm does, I guess they insure bonds for somebody. Uh, you know, obviously we've seen some pretty crazy volatility in the fixed income world uh, this year, right? This is, you know, kind of shocked a lot of people. So uh, possibly, you know, what you have is kind of an, an environment where uh, bond insurance, the demand for bond insurance is going to be much higher. I'm not really sure, but it was interesting. So what we saw was a buyer of 1500 of the Jan 17 and a half calls. Just, they just paid a quarter, but it is opening. Uh, and there's a little bit more volume in there, um, in there on the day. I think we're up to about, uh, 1600 of these contracts. So, um, just kind of a straight bullish position. Uh, you know, as I said, uh, Jody's view was that financials are, are going to struggle a little bit, uh, you know, which might mean if you, uh, you might, might be at a kind of an environment to consider an overwrite on something like this, right. Uh, with the stock here. So, um, just a call buyer in the, uh, those Jan 17 half calls with the stock only at 1436. So, um, I don't know if it pays a dividend, uh, yield or not, but, um, you know, obviously sometimes people like to sell calls. It doesn't look like it pays any dividends, uh, sell calls to, to basically kind of create some yield there. I think, uh, 18% out of the money call buyer and something as sleepy as bond insurance would be just a, a road to ruin. And yet this name is popping hard over the last few weeks. So maybe they're on to something that we don't know. Mr. Rock Lobster, do you sense potentially some excitement in the otherwise sleepy realm of bond insurance, sir, for AMBAC and the call buyer? Yeah. You know what? I would like this kind of call. Like, why would you ever buy these things? That's, that's the first thing that screams out to me. Then the stock you know, pops a buck today. And, so yeah, and I know Henry. And, you know, and he's he's like, wow, this is this is some odd. Yeah, yeah. You're like normally you would say, yeah, you would write these for a quarter and be happy. <laughs> I mean, uh, but nobody would buy them. Um, so yeah, it does have kind of all the look and the whiff. Although there is, I do see two thousand of the December seventeen and a half puts trading kind of strangely. Um, I don't know if that's has anything to do with it. It's the same today. Um, yeah, but definitely like these, these stocks kind of don't do much, um, unless it's a disaster and the vol goes to the moon because, you know, they can't insure anything or they're blowing out or something like that. So odd one. Yeah. I would, I would go with Henry's prognosis there that like these funk, these financial companies going into the higher rates is going to be a little suffering. Um, and then the SPR, somebody just cheated yesterday. They knew the stock was going to go up and they cheated because, why, why would this why would this stock go? They would be magically right on buying all those calls. So I'm trying to rescue myself from earlier, but looks like the cheaters made some money yesterday or they're making it today in SPR. Cheaters making some cash. Uh, speaking of, I don't know if they're cheaters or just or early, early diver inners here. We had a couple we profiled on the Monday show. We could kind of come up against it. Maybe we can pay off one of these. Uh, let's go to let's go to the Monday show for the one that had earnings right after we did them this was uh this was from the monday show we talked about everyone's favorite out here listeners this was gen digital the multinational software company co-headquartered in tempe arizona and prague czech republic everyone's favorite multinational digital platform on the show well before we get there really quick let's break down the year again uh the, a year ago it was trading about 23 bucks and that was also the high was 23.92 that came in the February, early February timeframe. And then they crushed it down to its low for the year of about 15 and a half. That was in May. Then they rallied it again up to about a little over 20, almost 21 bucks. That was back in August. Then they crushed it again back to about 16 and two thirds. Uh, that was right around the Halloween timeframe. And when we talked about it on Monday with earnings coming up the next morning, the stock was trading 17.55 and somebody was looking for a whole bunch of upside. They were scooping the Nov 18s. Uh, they bought 3,523 for 52 and a half cents. We looked like it was a bit of a sweep. Listen, they started buying them uh, earlier for 35 cents, about 15 minutes earlier. They were 30 at 35. Then they came back and said, uh, how are they now? <laughs> and they bought 1,000 for 50 cents. So that market moved. They were 35 at 50 after that. And it looks like they bought the balance, 3,523 for 52 and a half cents. So Quite a few of these Nov 18s were trading on the day. Total of 14,000 traded on the day. Not all of them in this print, obviously. And it looks like after they had earnings the next uh, day, these kind of worked out. Uh, the stock right now, listeners, $19.12. So up quite a bit, up about a buck sixty or close to it from where it was on the show on Monday. Uh, interestingly enough, they did 14,000, but there are still about 10,000 open on this track. So it's like somebody may have taken off a few thousand 
immediately post earnings. Uh, but since then, looks like they're still riding these bad boys. And now these are Nove, so they have more time, listeners. These are not weekly, so they don't have to get out of them tomorrow. But we were saying on the Monday show, we're probably going to know if these worked out by the Thursday show. And that seems to be the case. Uh, Mr. Flowmaster, are, did you notice these from the Monday show, the size block of Nove 18s? And then what are your thoughts? It seems like a bit of a of a trend these days. People put on the trade. It works out their way. And then they just sit on them. They don't do anything with them. Have you noticed that as well, sir? What are your thoughts on these Gen Nova 18s? Uh, well, I didn't notice them. Is, is this crypto related or is this um, something else? I'm not even sure what the. This is just, just a, a multinational company. software company that provides like cyber security. Oh, okay. I think these guys might own Norton LifeLock and those kinds of things. Um, I didn't see it, but we do see plenty of situations where. You know, somebody makes a trade, it goes their way. This happens in in hedges all the time, right? You buy, you know, somebody buys some puts as, as a portfolio hedge. The market dumps, and instead of, you know, the the and there's research on this. The the hedges have to be monetized, and you know, profitable trades. I think basically, if it's a you know, if it's a trade that goes your way on, and it's a speculative trade, you just have to have a plan. You know, some people like to take off half and and get to break even or something like that. Um, but you know, this almost might this might be one of those situations where uh, they just didn't quite you know they they didn't capture anything, uh, and you know you, you gotta you have to be disciplined about the plan. The Rock Lobster, what are your thoughts, sir? A whole boatload of the Nova Eighteens going their way, but not getting the heck out of Dodge, at least not yet, sir. Um, I, you know what? I, I, I would like to say we haven't seen that before, but we have seen that before. I've seen it like every day. It seems like, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I one thing with my students, like the UVIX puts, you know, I had a target did not go as well as I wanted, uh, except obviously for the listeners that bought them for 15 cents. Now they traded two seventy five. but yeah, some of our listeners chiming in, they, uh, Christmas came early as they said. So yeah, they, uh, yeah. they, it did. <laughs> And uh, am I, you know, and I was like, okay, if I could just get out of Dodge at 275, make a little profit, I totally screwed up managing this. But you still got to close, you know, options are meant to be closed. Like, it's what I tell my students, you like, if you're an investor, you can take delivery. If you're a trader, you need to close. Um, and that's how you tell the difference between the two. So you don't want your trading to, I would say, invade the investing because you could take that long-term thesis and get wiped out on short-term trades. So um, I make it easier that way. But yeah, but if you know, you, you're buying out of the money specy calls, um, you know, and it, it does look like they're still sitting there. I mean, uh, we have what? They still have some time to go. There's 9,000 open, but you would think they might want to take the money here before it's too late. We would think, obviously, these are noves. These are not the weekly, so they got a little bit of time, so we shall see. But right now, looking good. Whether that's still the case in a week or two, we shall see. Speaking of running out of time, listeners, we are coming up against it, so it is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block, the portion of the show where we tell you what we're keeping an eye on until our next episode. Who needs Uncle Mike to fill an hour? We're having fun here on the show uh, without the unclest of Mike's. But he's going to have fun, Mr. Flowmaster, who are the, the keeper of all things zero-day data right now. You're just talking about slinging your size five lot earlier in the show. Our question of the week is right up your alley right now. We're saying everyone is obsessed with zero-day options trading these days, but how are you actually using them in your trading? We gave you four choices, income or premium harvesting, short-term hedging, so, you know, buying your put around earnings, that sort of thing, listeners. Uh, short-term speculation, so flipping that, maybe buying a call around earnings, or you don't touch zero day at all. Mr. Flowmaster is our resident zero day junkie. What would your use case be? First off, how do you fall in this? And then B, where do you think our audience is falling? Well, I, I've been on both sides. I, I definitely played around with the kind of automated condor selling for a few months, made a little bit of money. Um, but as I said this morning, you know, after thinking about the leverage, I actually turned into a premium buyer and did OK. So, you know, I think that uh, these products, they're one of the reasons they're so busy is there really are a lot of different use cases and some of them are buying and some are selling. And now we have ETFs that sell the the one day uh, options as well. So you have a little bit of everything going on. I would say that our listeners probably uh, are, are trying to capture premium though. 
All right, Mr. Rocklop, the same question for you, sir. Income, premium harvesting, short-term hedging, short-term spec, or you don't trade zero day. Which way do you think our audience has fallen, sir? I think they're going into the income premium, premium harvesting uh, uh, area, but I use them when I have like a wild bug for a one-day thing. So um, when it looks like there's a huge, strong trend, then I, I'll do them. But that's that's kind of what I, how I trade them. Um, not often, but there I look at them. I look at them more and more these days. So you're a wild specker, and our audience, interestingly enough, there is definitely a section of our audience that is skeptical of all things zero day. We do speak to, I think, some of the more the more uh, bleeding edge of the options market. And they're, I think, a little bit skeptical of these because that's reflected in our data right now. 45.1% of you out there saying you don't trade zero day, which is, uh, which is interesting. Not exactly surprising to me given some of the polls we've done in the past. There definitely is a segment of our audience that is not enamored with all things zero day. 29.4% uh, right behind it saying income or premium harvesting. Then number three, short-term spec, 15.7%. And bringing up the rear, the purpose for which you could argue they were created, short-term hedging, only 9.8%. So get out there if you haven't voted yet, listeners. You got about a day left. Uh, here we got our one of our pro members, Aja Del Aquarius, saying, I was a kid who understood not to play with matches. As an adult, I don't touch zero DTE either. Uh, you know what? You're, you're clearly not alone. All, half of our audience right now is saying uh, they're in that same ballpark. As we're coming up against it, so let's go around the block. Mr. Flowmaster, we'll start with you, sir. What are you keeping an eye on until your next appearance next Thursday, sir? Uh, well, I, I, I just put some data up on LinkedIn, just kind of highlighting where we were in volume and, you know, on the year, basically these zero day, day options, they, it is the story of the year for sure. And it's also basically driving almost all the growth that we're seeing. So market volume is going to be up around 8 percent, 11 billion contracts, 11.2. Uh, it's almost all from these new the, these new new shorter expirations that people are finding different ways to trade. Uh, and I will actually mention that in one of the times I saw Saznov speak, Somebody asked him about the growth of the market, and he said he could, he believes we're about five percent of the size that we could be. So, meaning, you know, instead of forty-three million contract days, we should be seeing we could be seeing two hundred and twenty million contract days, which is, I think, a pretty pretty exciting view. I want, I want him to be right. right, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I share his, his enthusiasm, but talking a little bit of his book there. But hey, all of our book is that. That's all of our book at the end of the day. Volume goes up; it helps everybody. Uh, so yes, let's all hope he is right. Uh, Mr. Rockloff, the same thing. What are you keeping an eye on until our next show on Monday, sir? Uh, well, this is our first red day in, what, nine days? Uh, VIX up and SPX down, not liking the auction, and Powell's about to speak, so they're going to like that even less. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but I will go with, you know, Sostov, you give him credit. He is a pretty, <laughs> pretty excellent marketer, so... Uh, maybe his uh, his nose is a little better than most on that score. So yeah, I a a higher amount of uh, contracts would be great. But I would like to see how we get past these Powell statements. If the market actually holds up red today, but I have to say, if it if it's if it's a green day today, I think we're going to be off to the races because everybody will feel like it is all okay to get back in the water. Well, speaking of Sazanoff and all things Tasty, the CEO of Tasty Trade will be joining us on the Monday show in the newly minted Tasty Trade hot seats. So we can put it to him if he agrees with Tom and his outlook for our 220 million. So look forward to that on the Monday show, listeners. But that is going to do it for the Thursday episode. That's also going to do it for the network content today. Remember, you already got Twifo yesterday, listeners. That's already in your hot little hands. But before we go, let's go around the block see what everyone has cooking that may interest you let's start with mr rock lobster sir if they want more rock lobster goodness in their lives where should they go what should they do sir yeah 888 trade zero one uh for all of uh the option week goodies have you heard this show you get 10 percent off say andrew sent you so uh and that way i know all the all the yak and i do with longo uh, has some value so there you go. 24 and three quarters for Ubix. Glad I bailed on my puts yesterday morning. So that, that worked out there. We'll get to more of that fun on oddities, sir. Optionpit.com, the place to go. And Mr. Flowmaster, sir, if folks want to check out all these cool goodies I'm playing with during the show, so all the trade alert data, all the uh, all the bells and whistles, as well as maybe your cool uh, trade of the day report, maybe coming to one of them soon. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? 
So SIBO.com slash RMA is where we have all of our platforms and data offerings. Uh, sadly, that trade of the day report is not yet accessible there. So you have to get a hold of me uh, some other way. You can always find me on LinkedIn or, um, or just email Mark and he can help. Um, but I'm just going to be watching the market. You know, this, this derivative summit that we have at SIBO is, is just it's, it's really such an amazing time to see the work we have going into different things. Analytics, we, we had a nice discussion of the theoretical basing for uh, for all of the markets that we're monitoring, which now includes some inter some international markets as well. So more to come. But SIBO.com slash RMA to, to bang around on our platforms. Check it out, listeners. And of course, see, he couldn't join us today. He was on assignment, but give him a bit of a follow as well at Mike Tussaw, T O S A W, on Twitter or check out his website, stcharleswealth.com, the place to go. We got to get on out of here. Back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, with our buddy, the once in future, Dr. Vix, holding court on a little bit of volatility views. After that, exclusively for our pro folks with Options Oddities. So if you haven't joined the Secret Club yet, what are you doing, listeners? Still time to get in on Options Oddities. I got a feeling we're going to break down some more UVIX fun on the show tomorrow, as well as all sorts of other fun trades that have been lighting up our radar. TheOptionsInsider.com slash pro, the place to go to learn more. Then we're back again on Monday with the folks from Tasty and another episode of The Option Block. Stay safe out there, everybody. The Option Block is brought to you by SIBO. SIBO's suite of S&P 500 index options, SPX and mini S&P 500 XSP options, allows traders to speculate on the direction of the market, generate income, and hedge for downside protection of their portfolio of stocks. No matter what kind of trader you are, there's plenty of useful information to take the guesswork out of creating your portfolio strategy and to help you make more educated moves in the market. Visit www.cbo.com slash SPX today to learn more. The views expressed herein are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of CBOE Global Markets Incorporated or any of its subsidiaries, collectively CBOE. The information provided is for general education and information purposes only. There are important risks associated with transacting in any of the CBOE products or any of the digital assets discussed here. Before engaging in any transactions in those products or digital assets, it is important for market participants to carefully review the disclosures and disclaimers contained at www.cboe.com slash us underscore disclaimers these products and digital assets are complex and are suitable only for sophisticated market participants these products involve the risk of loss which can be substantial and depending on the type of product can exceed the amount of money deposited in establishing the position market participants should put at risk only funds they can afford to lose without affecting their lifestyle you're listening to the options insider radio network the home of the options podcast for more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.